We're pleased to be joined here this afternoon for our closing session with Mark Elsden. Mark, many thanks again for agreeing to participate. Very grateful to have you with us. Um, in 2021, you were our FBDI Summit keynote speaker. Um, and at the time, you discussed some of the insights that you captured in your great book, We Aren't Broke. Two years later, you are the editor of a collection of essays and the book Gone for Good. And I will say I'm honored to be one of the contributors to the book and glad to say that the first 300 people who logged on today for our summit will receive a free copy of the book. So, Mark, why don't you tell us why you wrote Gone for Good and what the premise of the book is? Sure. Yeah. Well, of course, to be clear, I didn't really write Gone for Good. I kind of convened and edited it and you and all the other amazing folks that wrote it, uh, wrote most of it, but it is a it is a great collection of essays and thanks for your participation along with the other folks that are that wrote some good stuff. So um, really for me, there's a driving question that uh, that keeps me working and kind of keeps me up at night, to be honest, and that is when we look back 20 years from now um, at the at the transitions that have happened around property owned by houses of worship, and we realize uh, that a third or a quarter of them have become something else, um, where are we going to be, you know, 20 years from now when we look back at that moment? And what will we have lost in that situation? What might we have gained? What could we have done differently um, and intentionally to, to encourage good transitions? Um, will all of those transitions of property be gone for good, as in gone forever, or gone for good, uh, as in something new, good um, in their place? So that's really what drove me to, to gather the folks together to reflect on uh, on this question um, around the wave of church property and uh, houses of worship property transitions that's, that's coming in the United States. And Mark, it's interesting, the, the theme for this year's summit is uh, faith-based community development, the evolution of a movement. Talk to us a little bit about some of the issues and the trends in the faith-based community development field that have emerged and expanded since you wrote We Aren't Broke that informed your thinking for engaging the authors of Gone for Good? Yeah, so, I mean, when I wrote Re We Aren't Broke, um, uh, most of that book is, a, is about investment assets. So investment assets held by uh, religious institutions and houses of worship around the U.S. And then I had a chapter in there about um, buildings and land and property. But it became clear very quickly, even as that book came out, that there was a pressing question and need around um, buildings and land and property. And I think the pace of that conversation has just dramatically increased, even in the last two years. Um, the pace of transitions has dramatically increased. And so the amount of um, property that's being sold or repurposed or redeveloped is really rapidly rising. And it's kind of this, this curve that's just you know really climbing. Um, interest, I'd say, from houses of worship and others to repurpose those properties is really on the climb. And I guess in there's two particular um, kind of sets of people that I think is really interesting that have gotten more involved. One is denominations and uh, middle governing bodies, judicatories. So I think, you know, as many movements sort of go, whether this is a movement or not, but as many movements go, it often starts from the ground up, right? The local congregation, the local synagogue or whatnot. And then it becomes, you know, more um, connected to the systems and the structures and uh, denominational bodies are taking a lot more interest, even in the last year, as far as I've been able to see in this question. I mean, even just for an example, uh, my one of my organizations, Rooted Good, just agreed to a, a license agreement with one of the national denominations to uh, make our Good Futures Accelerator available to over 8,000 churches around the U.S. And that, that came about at the end of this year here. And so there's just a, a growing interest in that. And then another area or, or set of folks that I think have re-engaged or engaged new ways is um, city planning and municipalities. Um, that's been really interesting to see as they start to realize this is a, you know, not a one by one phenomenon. I mean, cities have often dealt with a church here or a house of worship there that's transitioning to something else, but suddenly they're now facing six out of eight becoming something else or 40 out of 100 becoming something else. And that's a whole different scale and sort of ball game, you might say, than one here and one there. 
And, uh, you know, even here in Madison over the last six months, I've been in conversation with the plan commission here and the planning department around our comprehensive plan in Madison. And, um, and I think we're on the cusp of making some amendments to it to allow for more uh, uh, housing development um, to be built uh, on property owned by houses of worship, which is super exciting. And that's sort of as a result of the book and the, the conversation and just the awareness that's growing among folks in planning departments and in, in municipalities around this issue being a really pressing, a pressing issue to consider. So all of those things have happened or been happening kind of simultaneously. Yeah. And Mark, let me ask, in your experience, very fascinating to hear about both the nominations and uh, city planning uh, departments being really kind of starting to hone in on this. And even throughout today's conversation at the summit, hearing from the, the Church of God in Christ, hearing from representatives from local governments, it, it's a nice tie-in to what you're saying. I'm curious if there are any key messages or insights that you have found that have helped with the breakthrough, right? So you're saying that the nominations seem to be on the uptick, city planning. Are there things that are helping people get it, right? That makes yeah. them say, aha, this is why this really makes sense. What Or the converse is, are there some messages that really aren't resonating and that you think we have more work to do? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think the size and scale of the transition is probably the primary thing that drives interest, right? So people, again, realizing this isn't just here and there, a little bit here and there, but that it's really a big change, right? And so in the next decade, we're going to see a lot of transition of property. And that kind of lights a little bit of a fire, right? And we got to do something about this. We got to figure this out. We can't just uh, kind of go on as business as usual. We got to do think about this differently. So that is probably the the main thing. And then I think there is just, uh, at least on the city and probably the denominational level, individual congregations and leaders and pastors and, uh, you know, religious leaders are asking for help on a, on a much more rapidly increasing basis. And so they're getting, you know, getting it from all angles. Um, and then I think you're growing awareness that there's a there's an impact on the social fabric of our communities as these transitions take place. You know, where are the Girl Scout troops going to meet and the neighborhood associations and the AA group's going to meet when all these uh, properties are, where are we going to vote? I mean, so much voting in the United States takes place in houses of worship, or is that all going to happen when those properties are something else? And there's kind of that growing awareness of that, uh, of that reality. Yep. Yep. That, and curious if you have found Mark in your, in the, the, the essays that you saw in the book, um, and, or just again, your work around the country now trying to help people at the very early stages, right? Mm -hmm. Have you found that there are some common themes that emerge in terms of the fears that people have, but also the hopes that people have about this work? Yeah. I mean, certainly, again, you know, keep saying it, but I think the size and scale of this transition is probably the main thing that keeps emerging. People are sort of starting to say, ah, now I get this is really this is really a big, a big deal. And the importance that houses of worship have in the social fabric of our communities and the huge hole that's going to be left if they end up vacant. Right. Or if they end up just developed kind of for personal individual wealth creation or something like that, um, which are which are all possibilities. Um, there's also, I think, uh, some, some of the themes I've noticed is a growing understanding of zoning, uh, changes that are needed, right. And planning related changes. And so incentivizing kind of good development while there's an opportunity, um, while, you know, not really encouraging bad, bad development, right. While that's happening, because this is kind of a once in a many generation shift. Um, you know, the, the, it's not like these properties are going to sort of become, some new development for 10, 20 years, and then go back to being a house of worship late, late house of worship late, house of worship later. I mean, maybe a little bit, but you know, for the most part, these are one-time shifts. They're going to turn into something else, and then we're going to end up with whatever that something else is. And so, as we think about incentivizing and kind of encouraging those things to be community-oriented spaces for the common good, um, there's a recognition that we can do that, or in the case of affordable housing, for example, if we have infill 
development opportunities in cities all over the United States, we've got kind of one chance to develop those infill spaces, right? That's on um, land owned by houses of worship. So let's make the most of that, right? Let's not just uh, put one or two houses on a property, but let's think about how we can do a little bit more density, a little bit more utilization of that uh, of that land and a little bit more housing, which is you know desperately needed in so many of our cities. So that's happening. Um, I think I've also seen there's a growing uh, uh, concern, awareness about um, financing and funding, right? So what are the, meth the, the, the pathways for pre-development funding, um, for permanent financing that, again, are going to lead to the most fruitful, the best outcomes, um, concessionary you know, financing that are going to lead to better outcomes um, in the development process. So all of that is... Uh, is some of the themes I've seen emerging. And then, you know, hope, like you said. I mean, I think there's also, while there's some sadness and some grief around some of these changes, which is very real. And, you know, I was just talking to some pastors this morning about this. Um, you know, we, we, we don't want to rush past that real grief as we say goodbye to some of these beloved places or the way they used to be. But it's also a remarkable opportunity for something new in this moment um, and, you know, a really incredible chance to do something different with the uh, with the property that that so many um, faith based institutions have. And so, you know, there's some hope there to do something new and to, to right some wrongs and to do some do something exciting. You know, Mark, you were I was going to ask you about if you had a, a word of encouragement or advice for those who may be dubious about getting into this mm -hmm. work and or who are already in it and are just feeling like, woe is me, right? Woe is me, it's, it, why so long and why so hard? And I think you just hit on some of that, but if, if there's somebody who's out there who's thinking, I don't know, you know, still a little dubious or who is in the midst and wants to just kind of give up, right? Is there, and you wear multiple hats, right? The pastoral hat, you as a pastor, you as an author, you as a, a technical assistance provider. Um, is there even a good example that you point to as, as like an example of like, hold on, right? Or yeah, go ahead and get involved that you can point, that you point folks to that says, this is why you should get involved or why you should stay involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's so many examples, actually. I mean, there's so many interesting things happening with people doing, you know, co-working spaces and childcare centers for um, teenage mothers and uh, grocery co-ops uh, in their in, in their church buildings uh, to address food deserts and then housing, tons of affordable housing projects that are super exciting um, from Silicon Valley to, you know, to Washington, D.C. It's happening all over the place. And that that is just super, super thrilling to see. And again, yeah, I do think we we have an opportunity to do some things differently, right? So to right some wrongs maybe that need to be, to address some injustices that need to be addressed, to think differently about the way property is used. Just this weekend, um, the Cascades Presbytery in the, in the Portland area voted to sell, essentially to give, sell for a dollar, um, the, the, the land and the building of a, of a closed Presbyterian church to a consortium, a coalition of indigenous um, uh, folks that have developed this vision for tiny homes. Um, to, they're going to put tiny homes on this former church property to house um, First Nations people that are homeless. And it's an act of restoration to give this land back to the folks that um, lived on that land many centuries ago, and then to address this issue of, uh, of homelessness that's a very real problem. And to me, that's just a beautiful example of saying, okay, yeah, this church closed, let's grieve that, let's recognize sadness there, but let's also let it be reborn um, you know, in the faith tradition uh, of, of resurrection and let it be reborn uh, to something new and beautiful and life-giving um, and restorative in the way that that really is uh, that is wonderful. So there's opportunities like that that are happening all over the place. And yeah, it's not easy. Um, but you yourself have said, you know, it's not easy, but it can be done, right? We just Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. we gotta we gotta we press on and we we do what we can. And uh, you know, are we gonna get it right every time? No. Are we gonna you know, are we going to make the perfect decision about every piece of land and property? No, we're not. But let's make the best decisions we can and let's, um, you know, move the needle where we can and let's set the trajectory 
you know, towards uh, towards good and justice as much as possible, and uh, and then good things will come of that. Mark, such a good positive place to to end up. Really appreciate you taking the time to offer your insights to our audience from around the country and, and re- literally now around the world. And so we're grateful for that and the time and the work you're putting on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Elsden, who is the author of We Aren't Broke and the editor of Gone for Good. Uh, if folks are interested in learning more about Mark, it's on our, our uh, the, uh, summit website. So there's information on how to track down Mark and the great work that he's doing. Mark Elsden, thanks so much and God bless you, my friend. Thank you. Well, listen, we hope everyone has enjoyed today's mix, dynamic mix of conversations, dialogues, presentations. Uh, Thanks again to Reverend Mark Elson for closing us out. A reminder that uh, the first 300 folks who register today are going to, you'll get an email asking for your address because you're going to get a complimentary copy of Mark's book. Uh, It's been really some challenging conversation today. And as we've heard throughout the day, there's so much need and yet so much opportunity Um, There's so many real practical approaches that have been taking place, lessons to be learned um, from each other, from various uh, sectors, both in the faith community, the public sector community, the private sector community. Um, So we hope and pray that today's uh, dialogue and conversation has been enriching, has been informative, has been encouraging to all of those who've heard today and all those who will hear this in the future to keep at it. Uh, We know there's so much yet to be done, but so much progress that has been made as this movement continues to evolve. So let us continue to keep a focus on how we can have impact in the lives of people, how we can think about how we can engage with houses of worship and the faith base and the faith community uh, to do development that really has positive impact in the lives of people. Let's continue to work and collaborate together. We here at Enterprise uh, are grateful to be uh, continuing this work. Many thanks again to our sustaining sponsor, Wells Fargo, um, and to our partners at uh, Capital One for their support over the years. Many thanks again to all of my colleagues who work behind the scenes uh, to make this work really useful media, and also uh, our folks at uh, Greater Emmanuel International Church, uh, Church of God in Christ in Detroit for their help. God bless each and every one of you all. Stay faithful in the work, and we'll look forward to seeing you laboring in the vineyard.